welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years, we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Al Gore is co-founder and chairman of Generation Investment Management. He is a senior partner at Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers and a member of Apple Inc's board of directors. But he spends the majority of his time working with the Climate Reality Project, a nonprofit organization he founded to pursue solutions to the climate crisis. He was elected and re-elected by the citizens of the great state of Tennessee to the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate, and he served as Vice President of the United States from 1993 to 2001. In 2007, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his efforts to raise awareness on global warming. From his earliest days in public life, he has been warning us of the promise and peril of emerging truths, no matter how inconvenient they may be. And now in his newest book, The Future, he identifies six drivers of change that he believes are transforming our planet and the way we work, live, and interact. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, the 45th President of the United States, Al Gore. <laughs> President? Thank you very much. I think that might have been a partisan Freudian slip. I don't know. But I was president of the Senate anyway. And ladies and gentlemen, what a, a pure joy it is to be here in this beautiful sanctuary and to be able to spend some time with you. I've been looking forward to this. And uh, I welcome those in the two overflow rooms uh, here and uh, those listening on Minnesota Public Radio. Uh, the Westminster Town Hall Forum is proof positive that in Minnesota, at least, democracy is alive and well with a well-informed citizenry. <clears throat> I, of course, want to express my gratitude to Tim Hart Anderson, a pastor and head of staff, and uh, also uh, express my thanks to Common Good Books handling the book selling. I encourage everybody to patronize the local uh, independent bookstores. Uh, they play a big part in our democracy also. I'm not going to try to single out the friends I know who are here because there are too many of them and I want to get into the subject, but I want to uh, say how grateful I am that former Vice President Fritz Mondale is here, and I, <laughs> I'm so grateful. And uh, I haven't seen him, but I'm told uh, that uh, Mayor R.T. Ryback is here, also the mayor of Minneapolis. And <laughs> in any case. So how do you feel about the future? The title of this book is The Future, and the subtitle is Six Drivers of Global Change. Early in the project, I asked someone that question, how do you feel about the future? And he said, I feel fine. <laughs> and uh, it, it just uh, reminded me instantly of a story that I first heard on the radio 35 years ago, when I was a young congressman in Middle Tennessee, finishing up a long Saturday of town hall meetings and driving back to my farm, and the Grand Old Opry was on the radio, and in those days they had a comedian named Cousin Minnie Pearl. <laughs> and some of you here will remember her. She's the one that had the price tag still on her hat, and she was from the mythical community of Grinder Switch, Tennessee. Well, she told, uh, this story about a farmer who was involved in an accident. 
and uh, he suffered some harm and hired a lawyer and sued uh, the driver of the other vehicle for damages. And the driver of the other vehicle got a lawyer and uh, that lawyer put this farmer on the witness stand during cross-examination and asked him, isn't it true that immediately after this accident you said, I feel fine? And the farmer said, well, it's not that simple. You see, I was taking my cow to town in the back of my truck, and this feller came driving across the center of the road, and the lawyer said, wait a minute. We're involved in a trial here. We don't want to hear a long, involved story. Just answer the question, yes or no. Did you or did you not say, after the accident, I feel fine? And the farmer said, well, I was leading up to that. <laughs> you see, I was driving my cow to town in the back of my truck. <laughs> And this feller came driving across the center of the road and ran right smack dab into my truck and knocked it over and threw me out, threw the cow out. I was on one side and the cow was on the other. And the highway patrolman came up and took one look at that cow and said, mm, she is suffering. Pulled out his gun and shot her right between the eyes. <laughs> <coughs> and then he came around to my side of the truck and said, how do you feel? And so, I said, I feel fine. <laughs> and I think there's a, a lot about the future that uh, evokes that uh, what is the alternative uh, quality. About eight years ago, I was making a speech over in Europe at a conference where somebody asked me, what are the drivers of global change? And I gave an answer that I thought was adequate. In fact, I thought it might have been a little bit better than adequate. But when I got on the plane to fly back to the U.S., the question kept nagging at me, and I pulled out my computer and made uh, an outline uh, and then revised the outline uh, and revised it again and kept on working it. Uh, and over time, it became a pretty elaborate document. And it actually had some practical value. Um, uh, the pastor mentioned that uh, I founded an investment firm, Generation Investment Management, with my partner, uh, David Blood. Um, as an aside, I wanted to name that firm Blood and Gore. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, I really did. I, I thought. It would have instant brand recognition. And anyway, uh, this outline uh, of the drivers of global change actually became useful as one of the inputs into building an investment model and an investment process. Anyway, I kept filling it in, and about two years ago, I decided that it might be of interest to others. And so I've, sp I've cleaned all the furniture out of my living room in Nashville and put up these giant whiteboards and got research underway, 15,000 pages worth. In the last two years, I've really been sorting through this and, and working hard. And uh, one thing that really struck me right away in making a study of this is that we have never, we human beings, have never lived in a time where so many revolutionary changes are happening simultaneously. We've got globalization of the economy with jobs being shipped over to other countries, and we've got not only outsourcing but robo-sourcing with much more advanced forms of automation uh, replacing jobs in a pattern that may give the lie to the old, what they call the Luddite uh, fallacy, where New technology always creates more new jobs than it displaces. That may not be true anymore. There are a lot of serious people who are taking a hard look at that. Uh, we've got uh, virtual factories uh, with supply lines extending to hundreds of countries. And the relationship between these uh, multinational corporations uh, and nation states is very different today than it used to be. And what has emerged is Earth, Inc., uh, a, a, f a nearly fully integrated global economy that has different characteristics than it did in the past. Now, at the same time, we've got a trend uh, 
uh, underway to connect everybody uh, digitally uh, with smartphones and computers over the internet and the World Wide Web. And increasingly, there are intelligent devices and sensors and machines that also connect to the internet. We have instant access to databases that include uh, all the world's knowledge, practically, it certainly seems like it. I, I know that many here have had the same experience I have of being in, in a conversation or sitting at the dinner table and something comes up and everything stops while you look it up on <laughs> Google. Uh, and uh, one of my friends, a woman named Sherry Turkle, wrote a book called Alone Together. Uh, and you know what that means, where people are in the same house, in the same room, sitting across from one another, and both of them are just uh, locked into uh, what I call the global mind. Uh, and the rapid advance in artificial intelligence uh, is bringing a whole new world. There are disputes and arguments among the experts about how quickly these thinking machines will uh, approach the kind of complex problem solving that people are capable of, but there are already some things they can do better than we can. Uh, and uh, one example, there's a new algorithm, a new computer program that some law firms are beginning to use that makes it possible for one first year law associate to do the same amount of research work that used to require 500 first year law associates. Uh, and the quality is better because the computer doesn't make as many mistakes. Uh, one of these intelligent machines just won Jeopardy, you may have noticed, uh, playing against the champions. And before that, won the uh, World Chess Championship. Uh, it's sort of like the old story about John Henry uh, being defeated by the, the mechanical pile driver, except this time the contests are ones that involve our cognitive capacities. And the global mind to which uh, all of us are connected is not entirely benign. On, on balance, it's an extremely positive and hopeful development. But uh, there are a lot of companies and criminals, hackers, uh, and others out there that uh, take advantage of it. Uh, one company, just as a quick example, uh, if you look up a word right now on dictionary.com, uh, they will, without you knowing it, put 234 small computer programs called cookies on your computer or your smartphone that'll track you, your progress around the internet uh, from then on. Uh, we've seen the development of what I call a stalker economy, where they are, lots of these companies are collecting data about us and selling it mainly to advertisers. Uh, because they want to know uh, what you're uh, most likely to be interested in buying. Uh, and in, with some services, you send an email to a friend, and if you mention, uh, um, well, I'll give you an example. I sent an email uh, to my staff. It involved uh, the nation of uh, Morocco. Well, within the hour, I started getting big pop-up ads on my computer offering me uh, bargains on uh, direct flights to Morocco. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, that's just a little creepy, don't you think? I, I think it is. Uh, and, and the government is now building, almost has completed a $2 billion national security agency facility in Utah. And I'm no conspiracy theorist. Uh, but they are going to be capable of collecting every telephone call, every email, every text. Uh, that any of us send and storing it on file. Now, if there's a terrorist threat where they need to quickly sort through all the information in a particular area or whatever, uh, we want them to have that. But where do we draw the line? Because uh, the, the dark prophecies of Big Brother many years ago uh, are ones that uh, um, still are not in line with the real world, of course, but <clears throat> We've been served notice, and if there is too much uh, uh, digital data surveillance, uh, you know, the Bible says uh, that knowledge is power, uh, and uh, too much uh, information and 
voluminous files about every citizen in the hands of government equals a lot of power. Uh, and anyway, I go into that uh, in, in the book in some detail. But the business world is being radically changed by the global mind, and there's so much more. Uh, I'll give you another example. The, alongside the globalization of the economy and the emergence of Earth, Inc., and the global mind, this incredible interconnection of billions of people, uh, their thoughts and feelings and databases and smart machines. We also have what I call the reinvention of life and death, the, digital, the, the life sciences revolution that involves the new discoveries in genetics uh, and, and biology and proteomics and nanomaterials and nanotechnology. Uh, and we are now able to change the fabric of life itself. I'll give you a quick uh, example. Uh, probably no one here has a spider goat. Um, you know what a spider goat is, Mr. Vice President? Uh, I didn't either until I started researching this. Uh, it sounds like something I don't want to have. Uh, turns out spider silk is extremely valuable. It's hard to get, there's not that much of it, but it's stronger than steel and very flexible and useful for a lot of ap industrial applications. But you can't farm spiders. They're aggressive and cannibalistic, and uh, that's only some of the reasons you don't want to farm spiders. <laughs> but here's what you can do, and it is being done. You take the genes from orb-weaving spiders and splice them into goats. And then the spider goats secrete spider silk through their udders with their milk. And it's collected and strained and uh, kept and, and so. Everybody okay with that? <laughs> I feel fine about it. <laughs> In fact, uh, they are now able to not only cross the lines between species, but they are able to create entirely new life forms never known in nature. And down in the south, we have something called kudzu. Um, and I just want to be sure they've thought this through. Because, <laughs> you know, you get some of these novel, uh, never before seen little critters out there. Uh, I just want to be sure that they've thought this through. Uh, but of course, this revolution in life sciences is leading to wonderful and miraculous new possibilities for curing diseases and, and treating ailments that have resisted uh, cures in the past. Uh, still, it gives us the possibility where soon parents will be offered the possibility of selecting the traits they would like in their children. So eye color, check. Hair color, check. More intelligence? Parents aren't competitive, are they? <laughs> um, nations are competitive, too. And China uh, has been spending a lot of money to become the superpower uh, of genetics. And far more, they have a far more extensive effort than the United States does. And again, uh, there is a balance between all of the good things and the miraculous new possibilities that uh, are opened up and some of the uh, developments that, again, you just want to make sure they've thought them through. We have difficulty thinking about timescales relevant to evolution, but now we will be in charge of evolution. If we take the same short-term approach to decision-making without thinking adequately about the long-term evolutionary future of our species and of the web of life on Earth, uh, that could lead to trouble. And as always, my belief is that the way we make the, the best decisions is when our democracy is working well. And I'm going to circle back to that point in just a moment because it's one of the main themes of the book. But before I do, 
Let me also talk about another big change that's underway, and that is an historic change larger than anything that's happened in 500 years since Europe discovered uh, the New World, where the power balance, economic and political particularly, and military could follow, is shifting quite uh, significantly from the pattern that we're used to, where the United States of America is universally acknowledged as the leader uh, of the world, and the rest of the world looks to us uh, for the, the decisions that affect the world as a whole. China is rising. Their economy will soon be larger than ours. They have already surpassed us in many different fields. It's unclear whether or not their momentum can continue because they don't have a democracy. Uh, and that's not just an ideological uh, uh, slight to them. I don't think that uh, nations can proceed uh, on a course of progress for too long <clears throat> if there's repression and the complaints and uh, concerns along with the hopes and desires of the people have no way of being expressed regularly. But for now, they are rising very powerfully. A and power in the world is shifting from west to east, and it's being redistributed to emerging centers of power uh, in other parts of the world. Indonesia, uh, Brazil, uh, Turkey, uh, and of course, uh, this is associated also with a period of growth that is also completely unprecedented. We have quadrupled human population in less than 100 years. And to put that in perspective, uh, from the time when the scientists tell us the human race emerged in roughly our present form uh, 200,000 years ago, it took 200,000 years before we reached a population of 1 billion people. Well, we've added that many people in the first 13 years of this century. And we'll add another billion in the next 13 years. And then we'll add another billion still in the 14 years after that. And it'll slow down, and they believe it'll level off somewhere above 10. But our impact on the Earth is much larger now because there's so many more of us, and we are, on average, using much more powerful technologies. Uh, the chapter where this is dealt with is called Outgrowth, uh, and it's meant to imply that we're growing so rapidly that we're growing out of the bounds that mark the supply of some crucial resources, like fresh water and topsoil and the precious web of living species that are disappearing at a rate that really worries the biologists uh, uh, a, a tremendous uh, amount. Uh, it, it, well, here in the Midwest, uh, you, you know, in many places, uh, the uh, one gram of corn uh, uh, leads to one gram of topsoil going down the uh, Mississippi system. Uh, and in a, a lot of other countries, it's much worse than that. And we can't keep doing that while our numbers are growing and while the, the soil is being depleted and the allocations of fresh water are uh, being pulled away from agriculture and cities for fracking and for all of these different uh, demands on, on water. Um, and so the growth uh, is a real challenge. And let me make this point before I move to the next chapter because it's really important. What do we mean by growth? That's really an important question in part because every single national economic strategy is aimed at producing growth. Every single corporate strategy is aimed at producing growth. We kind of equate growth with progress. Growth is good, lack of growth is bad. So if we construct these rules and uh, configure the accounts and the strategies and the policies to produce growth, we ought to know what we mean by growth. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it really is crucial. Back in the 1930s, they defined growth with the creation of what's called GDP, gross domestic product. And after the Great Depression and the stock market crash of 29, <clears throat> a bunch of economists 
wanted to help the policymakers and the industrial countries to avoid going through that again. So they did a lot of hard work. And the one that uh, cracked the code was a man named Simon Kuznets. And in 1937, he was honored for creating GDP. And it has become the be-all and end-all. And the business accounts, again, are derived from GDP. I went back and looked at those debates and looked at his speeches and his writings, and it's amazing. He said, please do not use GDP as a guide for economic policy. <laughs> Why not? He said it excludes many important factors. And if you exclude these factors, you're going to get into trouble. What, what does it exclude? Well, pollution, for one thing. Uh, all negative externalities, you've heard that word before, externality. It's got so many syllables that uh, conceals the idiotic meaning. What it really means is you don't have to think about it. Uh, just ignore this, just pretend it doesn't exist. So pollution is in that category. Positive externalities are as well. What about the value received by society from investing in community centers and mental health care and music and art and uh, the strength of families and research and development and science? Well, all of those positive externalities are also ignored. The depletion of natural resources, ignored. So the topsoil and the fresh water reserves, that doesn't have to be put on anybody's accounting uh, ledger, much less a national accounting ledger. And here's the other thing that Kuznets warned was excluded from this compass that we're using obsessively, the distribution of income. So if you have growth in the economy, and 99% of it goes to benefit the top 1%, that's a big win for all of us. <laughs> well, since the Great Re Recession of 08 and 09, in this country, 93% of all the uh, growth in income has gone to the top 1%. And I'm not trying to sound like Occupy Wall Street, but you know, 75, 80% of the American people expressed agreement with the basic complaint they had, and it had to do with inequality. You take uh, uh, the, uh, the Walmart uh, founders, and they're lovely people, don't get me wrong, it's no criticism of them or their children. Sam and Bud Walton founded Walmart, and between them, they have five children and one daughter-in-law. Lovely people, again. But these six individuals now have more money than the bottom 100 million Americans, the bottom one-third of our country. Now, inequality is a necessary condition for capitalism. And it is not in and of itself bad. You're never going to eliminate it, and efforts to do so are doomed to failure and worse. But hyper-inequality, where the very few get most of the benefit and everyone else is feeling like they're struggling to get ahead and can't quite do it, that's not good for democracy and it's not good for capitalism. And so when we look at the wisdom and efficacy of our economic policies, we need to pay attention to pollution and positive externalities and the depreciation of resources and the distribution of income. So um, finally, um, before going to your questions, you'd be surprised if one of the six drivers of global change in a book by me wasn't the climate crisis. <laughs> and it is one of the six. And in my view, uh, you, you probably know my view. Um, we're in trouble on this, and we have the ability to stop the worst of it, but we're kind of sleepwalking to the edge of a cliff here. And you just think for a moment about the year we've just been through, 2012. Number one, it was the hottest year in the history of, the, uh, of North America. Number two, we had $110 billion of climate-related disaster damage. 
completely off the charts, never anything remotely close to that in the past. We had those massive fires in uh, the West again, and the bark beetles decimating the forests of the West. Worst outbreak of West Nile virus in history, so much so that uh, police departments in Texas were pleading with the public not to call 911 when they got a mosquito bite. Then we had 61% of the country in drought. Much of it's still in drought. And then we had Superstorm Sandy, which devastated lower Manhattan and New Jersey. By the way, the single most common critique of my book of several years ago, An Inconvenient Truth, and the movie, was uh, people who said that I was exaggerating when I showed the ocean water flowing into the World Trade Center Memorial site. That that had never happened. Well, it happened last October. <laughs> Way ahead of schedule. And in spite of all of this, and there are other things, the half of the North Polar Ice Cap disappeared uh, in the summer, and the rest of it, they say, is on the way to disappearing. And that affects the location of the jet stream. And you know, the weather's been a little weird. Uh, and we get these big downpours and floods two years ago in Nashville. Thousands of my neighbors lost their homes and businesses and had no flood insurance because it never flooded there. They called it a once in a thousand year flood. In any case, we go all through this last year in the midst of a presidential campaign with more presidential debates than we've ever had. And not one single journalist asked a single question to any of the candidates in any of the debates about the climate crisis. That is pathetic. Now, I want to conclude because I've gone just a few minutes over what I wanted to. I said at the beginning that the health of our democracy is an underlying theme in this book. I've served, I served for a quarter century as an elected official. Uh, I, I uh, had the great privilege of, of knowing and learning from Vice President Mondale. We were talking a little bit earlier about the way the Senate used to be, the way the House used to be. It's changed now. Our democracy has been hacked. That's a computer term where somebody takes over the operating system and makes the computer do things that you don't want it to do. Special interests now have taken over the operating system. In, the, in this sense, there's not a single big reform of any kind that can be passed in the Congress today unless they get permission ahead of time from the special interests that are most affected by it. Now, that's the truth. That's the truth. And it's wrong. A and the average congressman, and boy, you've got a great congressman here in Keith Ellison. Congratulations on <laughs> reelecting him. But the average congressman now spends more time begging special interests and rich people for money than they do dealing with their constituents. And that means that the next day when they vote or make a speech, human nature being what it is, they've just got to keep a weather eye on what these big donors are doing. And now the donors can do it anonymously and corporations are labeled people. Money is labeled speech and I guess they think might makes right. But none of those things are true, and they're all antithetical to what the United States of America is all about. I hope you will enjoy this book. I hope you will keep your hearts and minds open to, to becoming personally an agent of constructive change to shape our future in positive ways. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Vice President Al Gore. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum.
broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Al Gore. While the ushers collect questions from our in-house audience, I want to invite the radio audience to join us for our next forum on Thursday, February 21st at noon when acclaimed American composer Libby Larson will be our guest speaker. We'll be taking questions for our speaker from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is Westminster THF, and you can find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. That's the global mind at work. And now, Mr. Gore, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. In your book, when you get to this section on uh, some of the solutions you're proposing, you seem to be a proponent of American exceptionalism. Yeah. Can, you, can you speak about that, please? Yeah, and I've done interviews for this book with uh, reviewers and journalists in other countries. Uh, and they will often ask about that point as well. Uh, and I don't mean that when I say that the United States is the only country that can provide leadership to the world, I, I, I don't say that to, to express overweening pride in, in country. I am proud of our country. But I think it's just an objective truth about the situation in the world. Uh, who else can provide leadership in the world? The European Union? Uh, they've, they've got their hands full right now, and they don't have a president or an executive, and they don't have very many unified policies. China? Well, it's big and strong, but it doesn't command, it doesn't have the perceived moral authority to elicit uh, followership in the world. And during the period from 1945 to the beginning, the early years of this century, and particularly after the Berlin Wall and communism fell, the United States has been very successful in promoting democratic capitalism uh, and in the post-World War II years creating the United Nations and the Global Trading Organization, and you can go right down the list. But because we have been making a series of pretty bad and dumb decisions, uh, you can pick your own examples, but one that, spring, <laughs> one that springs to mind is that we invaded a country that didn't attack us. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. uh, we allowed uh, subprime mortgages by the millions to bring down the global economy. You know, just, just a word on that. When I made my first mortgage years ago as a young man, I went into Citizens Bank in Carthage, Tennessee, and I sat across the desk from Walter Glenn Birdwell, Jr. <laughs> and he asked me a series of questions, one right after another, designed, the answers of, to which were designed to give him confidence that I'd be able to make the monthly payments. And then I had to write something, what was it called? Y'all will remember this. A down payment, remember that? <laughs> well, in this subprime mortgage deal, they dispensed with the down payment, and they dispensed with any credit checks, and they gave 7.5 million mortgages in the U.S. alone to people who had no earthly way to pay them back. Seven mortgages went to a stripper in Las Vegas. L literally true. And so uh, w their, their theory was, well, yeah, that may look risky, but uh, we're going to lump them all together, and then we're going to sell them into the global marketplace and hook them up with these uh, very complicated, possibly phony insurance policies. And when that assumption that it would be okay was tested, it failed, and that's what caused a global run on the banks. In any case, in the realm of foreign, pol foreign policy leadership and economic policy leadership, the U.S. capacity to lead the world has been, uh, su has suffered a little bit. It can be reestablished. But my central point is the world needs a leader. And no other country besides the United States that I can see can play that role. So those of us who are Americans, because of our pride 
in what this country's meant to humankind for two centuries and more, and because we still are the indispensable nation, should see it as extra important that we reclaim the integrity and health and vitality of American democracy. A lot is at stake. The future is at stake. Those of us in this room and many of us in Minnesota know how urgent it is to make changes to prevent the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. How are we going to convince those who are not on the same page? Within this country? Yes, or yes. maybe around the world, but particularly this country. <clears throat> well, the same question was asked in my native Tennessee about civil rights. The same question was asked around this country about gay rights. And by the way, out of 32 state referenda, the only one to make the right decision is Minnesota. <laughs> and, but, but before that happened, and before uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden, just slightly before him, uh, changed position. Now, you never did anything like that, did you? <laughs> uh, uh, before that, the conversation was won. And, that, and we have to win the conversation on the climate crisis. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I, back when I was a, a boy in Tennessee in the summers, I remember when the conversation was won on civil rights. Because some of my, some of the guys in my circle of friends, one of them w said something vaguely racist, and one of my other friends said, hey man, cut that out. We, we, we're not into that. And he didn't do it again. Not too many weeks ago, there was a story about a gay couple in line for a movie. And, uh, they were holding hands, and somebody in the line it made a hateful comment toward them, and literally everyone else in the line turned on him and said, shut up, that's not who we are. They won the conversation. And that has to happen uh, on, on climate. We are putting today, you know, Earth Inc., 85% of all the energy for Earth Inc. comes from carbon-based fossil fuels. So today, we will put 90 million tons of heat-trapping pollution into the atmosphere as if it's an open sewer. And uh, it turns out the laws of physics actually do work and do apply to this heat trapping pollution, as the scientists said they would, and they trap enough extra heat every day. These calculations done painstakingly by the scientist Jim Hansen and a team of uh, experts. The cumulative man-made global warming pollution now traps enough extra heat every day to equal the energy in 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every day. Now, it's a big planet. But 400,000 Hiroshima bombs is a lot of energy every day. And it's that energy that's evaporating, that's disrupting the water cycle and evaporating more water off the oceans into the sky and the warmer air holds much more of it. So when a downpour is triggered, the floods are bigger and the soil is dried out because it's even more powerful in pulling the soil moisture out. The ice is melting, so the sea level uh, is rising. The warmer oceans also feed stronger wind storms. Uh, and it, it is threatening to destroy the conditions that have been conducive to the rise and flourishing of human civilization. We have never known since the first cities were built eight, nine thousand years ago, not long after the end of the last, last ice age. We have never known any climate pattern other than this one. Since agriculture first began in that same era, we've never known a climate pattern 
other than this one. And we are threatening it. Uh, and it is, it is foolish, self-destructive, and functionally insane. And I think that people are beginning to connect the dots with all these extreme weather events. I think that uh, after Superstorm Sandy, there was maybe a little bit of a tipping point phenomena there. I hope so. But please, I hope you will help to win that conversation. Mr. Gore, a number of our uh, best questions at these forums come from Minnesota high school students, so here you go, get ready. Oh, are they mostly up here? Yeah, they're right up there. Southwest High is here. From Southwest High School student, how can the U.S. government realistically do anything to halt the spread of hyper inequality in wealth? How can the U.S. government? How can the U.S. government do something? What can the U.S. government do to halt the hyper inequality? Well, we can change the tax code uh, and, and raise taxes on the very wealthy and reduce taxes on others. Somehow, uh, the, the, the forces of, uh, of extreme wealth and power have been able to make the case that they are job creators <laughs> and that the more money we give to them, the better off the rest of us will be. And it's almost as if they are, uh, that we're grateful to them for being our first line of defense against that terrible tax collector. <laughs> We've got to defend them from paying any more because they'll come for us next. <laughs> That's one thing we could do, but we also need a, a more intelligent enforcement of antitrust laws. Uh, we need to look at, at, at uh, how we can do a much better job of giving education, science, technology, uh, and math, uh, education particularly, but all kinds, uh, to empower people to hold down the new jobs that are emerging. We can improve the infrastructure with freer access to uh, Wi-Fi and the internet. Uh, there are lots of steps we can take, but I, I would start with the, with the tax policy. Another question from one of our high school students. Will it be necessary to eliminate money as an underlying political factor in order to achieve true change? And if so, how could we get the public to accept this? Yeah, um, <clears throat> when I first ran for Congress in 1976, and in every campaign that I ran in after that, part of my platform was 100% public financing for all federal elections. And it's easy to, to make a pledge like that. But I found it almost impossible to get others to support it. It was seen as unrealistic. In fact, in the 2000 presidential race, my opponents didn't even attack me on that proposal because they couldn't get people to believe that I had actually proposed it <laughs> because it was seen as so radical. But uh, I do think that uh, would be a good step. I think that the Citizens United case has to be uh, overturned, uh, and there are two ways to do it. There are some very thoughtful members of Congress who've done a lot of research and have concluded that it may require a constitutional amendment, and we all know how difficult that path is. An alternative way to overturn it would be to win the next uh, two presidential elections and get enough new justices on the court to overturn it that way. And, and, and that illustrates the fact that if you believe in the future of this country and you have a passionate commitment to, to making it a better country, it's a long game that we've got to play. Not just from one election to the next. It, it's a long game. We need to, we, we need to build support for the kinds of changes that are, are needed. Uh, in reading through your book, uh, it appears to me, the questioner says, that much of what I'm reading here is, is, has an underlying spiritual dimension to it. That in, in a way, what you're talking about are, are deep human spiritual issues. What is the role of the faith community in affecting these drivers of change? Yeah, I, I, um, I believe in God. I'm a Christian. I don't uh, wear it on my sleeve. I don't to, uh, write about it extensively in this book, but your questioner 
uh, evidently picked uh, that up. My first book, uh, Earth in the Balance, had a subtitle, Ecology and the Human Spirit. Uh, and I wrote about uh, uh, spiritual issues a little bit more in, in that book. Um, you know, where's the boundary line between uh, spiritual issues and uh, these secular issues? Uh, for many of us, there's really not one. It's, uh, it's risky to say that because we know full well how dangerous it is to get uh, religious fundamentalism mixed up with uh, our politics, and Lord, I don't want to do that, and, and that's not what I have in mind. But let me tell you what I do have in mind. One of the, one of the, the basic questions that is proposed is in this book is who are we? Who are we? And that is a question that our faith traditions uh, can help us uh, answer. I believe that we have many capacities for good or ill. I do think that we have a God-given ability to rise above our limitations. And when the chips are down and the stakes are high, we have a chance to be more than we imagine that we can be by drawing on our inner reserves. And the sub-theme in this book, the future, is this is such a time. We need to shape the future. We need to care about those who come after us. What advice do you have for? Go ahead. What advice do you have for environmentally active students to pursue their dreams? Learn everything you can about it. Uh, when you when you empower yourself with knowledge, you become more confident, uh, and, and you, you can be more effective as an advocate. Make an assessment of the pattern in your own life and find what kind of advocacy best works for you. The Climate Reality Project, which I chair mentioned earlier, will announce uh, in three weeks a new online an initiative that I'll try to get word to people on uh, that will be one way to do it, but there are many others. Final question, just have a, a moment or two. Are you hopeful for the future? I am hopeful, and my hope is, it kind of goes back to that I feel fine joke at the beginning, but <laughs> I am hopeful, uh, but my hope is premised on an assumption about human nature, and I more or less articulated it a moment ago. I think that we are capable of rising to big challenges. Uh, and I think uh, the answer to who we are is that w we are God's children. W we uh, have a duty to live our lives in a way that glorifies creation and uh, to care for one another. That's the source of real happiness. Uh, and I believe that uh, when we face these global challenges, we have the ability to, to rise to them. And as a result, I'm very optimistic. Thank you, Al Gore. Thank you all very much. Thank you.